In the previous lecture, uh, we were discussing the concept of root. As I said previously, root is something you run into right away when you study Tai Chi Chuan. It's considered very important. But the word is used in two different ways. Uh, uh, and I explained that in the previous lecture. But even when we take those two different ways, they bifurcate further into two other different ways in the sense that uh, we have uh, the same word used by hard boxing specialists, uh, karate, kung fu, whatever, or perhaps we won't call them hard, but we'll just say uh, that style, and taiji, which is extremely unusual, a completely different method of rootedness. Uh, so this produces a huge amount of confusion. We both use the same term. Uh, and a further confusion is caused by the fact that when most people do tui show, it turns into some kind of pushing contest in which they feel like they are being required to demonstrate their skill by being more rooted than the other person, which means he can't push you, can't make you take a step. This, as I said before, despite the fact that Taiji says you should never resist anything your opponent does. Uh, this seems like a conundrum completely, but people put it aside because they say, well, it's obvious that all my other fellow students are shoving on each other as hard as possible. As I said, yes, the previous lecture, um, even though you don't use this position to resist, you should understand the logic of the position because maintaining that position is one in which you can move the most efficiently. So in other words, those two things are synonymous, but they are not synonymous in hard boxing. In fact, they produce a problem because the most stable position is the position in which it's the most difficult to get yourself moving. You have to sort of make an effort to move. Uh, whereas, so they have kind of two different concepts in hard boxing. They have the stable, you know, the horse stance, the arrow stance and so forth. Then they have something like the cat stance where you stand on just one foot. Ah, that's considered, uh, you know, the crane or something. Uh, that is considered, uh, you know, the best stance to move from. But usually you'll move from this stance, even though you can deliver force in it. But then, you know, you want to, like, achieve these very stable stances also. So you can get maximum power, maximum rootedness, and so forth. So, again, they have a little conflict here. The beautiful thing in the Taiji method is that these are not in conflict. They're synonymous. The, the position from which you can move the best is also the position from which, if you wished to, you could resist force the best. So, <clears throat> and also, a stable position, by definition, is one that's stable through time. Uh, and uh, in Taiji, we're never stable through time. We are constantly changing all the time. The whole concept of Taiji is one of continuous change. So any rootedness that you might have in the sense of uh, being able to resist force is momentarily. It's just a momentary thing, and it changes immediately to something else. But the something else it changes to can constantly be a position which could receive force. What's this? The way this manifests is that if you have... A sudden force in which you actually have to break your training and say, ah, oh, you know, it's so fast that I didn't have time, I didn't have the reflex of releasing it, of being soft, of letting it go. You sort of, technique sort of fails you. But because you have constantly maintained this certain condition, oh, surprise, instead of you being knocked over, the other person is uprooted by your by your position, even though your position is just temporary. So this is something I really love about Tai Chi Chuan, and it's not just true in this case, but in the case of a lot of our disciplines, and that they work when they fail. Tai Chi Chuan works when it fails. Uh, as somebody who studied other boxing styles for 10 years, uh, from the age of 11, before I studied Tai Chi, uh, I can tell you, you don't like it when it fails. <laughs> in other martial arts, when things fail, you're in a lot of trouble. When Taiji, uh, when things fail, sometimes hmm, they really work out in a very funny way. And that's, it's so funny, in fact, that you tend to laugh 
And this sometimes can give you the reputation of being a kind of diabolical jerk. You know, people will say, it's not very funny that you just knocked me down. And you're thinking, no, 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 I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't think it's funny that I knocked you down. I think it's just funny that I expected that I, at that moment, I was losing. I was completely blowing it. I was completely, you know, I lost my technique and then suddenly everything worked out. This is a kind of fun thing about Tai Chi, which is one of my very favorite things. Now, unfortunately, to explain this Tai Chi method of rooting, uh, as I say, to master it takes a long, long time. And even to explain it takes, well, let's say it took me an entire book that I wrote called The Theoretical Basis of Tai Chi Chuan, which is pretty much devoted to what to how you create this kind of dynamic balance with the other person, which I explained in terms of what I call the metal ball, the wooden ball, and the air ball. And this is a kind of three-dimensional balance that you make with the opponent. You do this by doing uh, what we call in Tai Chi adherence. Adherence, uh, they say that, uh, you know, you have to learn how to yield and you have to learn how to adhere. Unfortunately, adherence is defined in the classics in an extremely subjective way. It's like it says when your opponent feels backed up, that's adherence. Well, <laughs> you can make your opponent feel backed up with a lot of pretty crude techniques. Even Western boxers talk about the skill of jamming the opponent, and making him feel cramped and unable to move. Uh, yes, when you do proper adherence, that is the effect of the opponent, but that does not define adherence. Adherence is when you make a taiji with the opponent. That is, when you have a point of your own body that yields, but then you match this with a point that goes into the opposite point of the opponent and creates a stable fulcrum in the middle. So in other words, you have a point that yields, but it becomes part of a system that is completely stable and does not yield. This is what Yang Zheng Fu meant when he said there is no retreat in Tai Chi Chuan, whereas the whole concept of yielding seems to imply retreat. Again, it would if it were not enhanced by the skill of creating a Tai Chi. Now, this has been explained by more people than me. It's part of the uh, you know, traditional lore of Tai Chi Chuan. But uh, it's usually explained, let's just say, in sort of one dimension. You make a taiji and, and it works. We have three dimensions. <laughs> Suppose I meet a perfect balance with the opponent. Uh, this still produces, you know, a whole lot of other directions they can go in that it's not stable. Uh, so my whole book is devoted to the idea that you have to create this balance in sort of three dimensions. And then you create this very stable system. As I say, you don't necessarily try to use this stable system in order to be fixed and resist force by your opponent. It's still used in a more elegant way to inform the process of stepping, which I personally think is the real skill of Tai Chi Chuan. Uh, now this um, technique uh, as I say, it is hard to explain. But just accept the idea that it is extremely unstable, and yet it produces what we call rootedness. Now, as I said in the previous lecture, there is also another way to look at the concept of root. And that is, I said in the other lecture, you might have an anchor which keeps your ship from moving, but you can also throw the anchor out and then you can use it to move the ship. This is the other concept of root. Not that keeps you fixed or makes you able to receive the force of the opponent, which, by the way, is pretty much never mentioned in the classics. But what is mentioned in the classics is the, the uh, aphorism that I quoted before. The internal force is rooted in the feet transmitted by the legs, directed by the waist, manifested in the fingers. This, as I explained before, does not mean that the source of your internal force is in the feet. Now, before going on, let me say, whenever they use the term internal force, don't think of something mysterious when they say this. The internal force, as it's referred to in Tai Chi literature, always means Chan Su Jing. It is always the method of Chan Su Jing. 
that is happening. So what it's really saying is your Chen Jing technique is rooted in the feet. Now, the Chen Jing technique is sometimes called a silk reeling force, which means that you move yourself around by making winding movements of the body. Now, the body always makes winding movements every time you walk around. I mean, when you walk in a straight line, you use pretty much linear motions. When you walk in circles, you are winding the legs. When you open a doorknob, and you twist the, that's winding movement. So we use winding movements all the time. They aren't that mysterious. But what is difficult and a real study is to uh, use these winding moments, movements in a serial way so that they create waves of winding changes that go through the body. <clears throat> this is when they become powerful. <clears throat> and even this can be misused in the sense of long force. In other words, I can use a winding force in a very long extended way. I can push, you know, a long distance with this. Um, this is not the preferred method of Jing. The preferred method of Jing is what they call broken Jing. And this means that the winding force is like a bolt of lightning. It's like it just snaps into place for a second. So even though it's winding, it uh, doesn't express a whole lot of winding motion. In the form, we practice completely moving the body by virtue of this winding force and showing our hand techniques to be continually expressing this winding force. Uh, we developed this habit, even though when we actually use it, we do not use it in a sense of pushing an opponent or you know, twisting him or something like this in a forceful, long sort of way. But it's used momentarily and instantaneously. <clears throat> now, this is the sense in which you are rooted in the feet. The actual force that you're using to move the body, the sort of initial impulse, which as I say, has to travel through the body in a wave and not just be activated all at once or casually in pieces that are haphazard, uh, comes from the qua. The qua is the joint connecting the hip and the leg. And this is the major muscle group of the whole body, the biggest group. And when the qua opens or closes, uh, this is activating this huge muscular thing. Now, if you were in a space station or something and you closed the qua, uh, the whole action that it exerted on your body would have to do with the mass of the body on the one side of the qua, the mass on the other side. So your leg would turn to a certain extent and your body would turn to a certain extent. If your body were enormously heavier, then the body would hardly move and the leg would do all the motion. But the point is it distributes this force equally, just like it tries to you know, affect both sides of, this, of the qua. However, uh, we make the foot rooted. <laughs> the rootedness of the foot is what keeps it from moving. Now, this is another thing. If somebody tries to tell you that um, rootedness works equally well on ice and, you know, some kind of mysterious thing like this. No, the rootedness that I explained yeah, uh, in the previous lecture, uh, the receptive force, yeah, that works fine on ice. But that you better not try to move yourself. The whole point is that was being completely stable. That was a stable situation. But when you try to move yourself with this kind of root, you'll slip all over the place and fall down. So, uh, what we, in other words, we depend on the friction on the floor. And every time we move, we should feel like the foot on the floor is trying to turn around the bubbling well, which is, well, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> but the bubbling well is the spot on the foot that you want to balance on. It's very, very much coincident with what the Western boxers call being on the balls of your feet, staying on the balls of your feet. Um, because it's not in the center of the foot but it's like a little forward right before the, where the toes are. This is the bubbling well. You want to feel like this is always trying to twist on the floor. And as I say, if the floor were ice, it would twist. There's no way, but you have a certain amount of friction on the floor and you use that friction to reflect the force that's trying to turn the foot so that instead it turns the waist completely and turns the body. This is what is meant by 
It's rooted in the feet, transmitted by the legs, and directed by the waist. The, the waist gives it a direction. The waist you know, reflects. So it's all reflected force that you are using. This is a completely other kind of meaning of the term root than our previous you know, receptive root. So I could call this the moving root or whatever. But this is the root that's actually expressed in the classics. To really do Tai Chi Chuan successfully, you should be able to do both of these. You should understand both, and you should understand the practices that cultivate both of them.